amazing Welsh organisation. Just going to tempt you with one more. <laughs> but I'm really pleased to introduce Faith Israel today. And she is the Diaspora and Inclusion Officer at the Sub-Saharan African Africa panel. Oh, I'm just going to check I said that right. Yes, Adv Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel, sorry. <laughs> who work closely with Welsh Government, with Fair Trade Wales, and she's going to talk a bit to us about global solidarity. So, if you, <laughs> thank you. Oh, hello. Right. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Faith, if you didn't catch that already. Um, I just want to say firstly, actually, thank you for having me here. I've been having a great time listening to all the talks and our interesting quiz we had yesterday. <laughs> that was, that was um, yeah, that was really fun. Really fun, fun lyric round. Um, yeah, I wanna say a big thanks um, to everyone that helped organize this. It's been amazing. Um, but yeah, so as you have kind of heard just now, I work for SSAP, which is the Sub-Sahara Advisory Panel. And it's an organization that was started in 2009 by members of the diaspora community in Wales who were really passionate about international development. And they wanted to come together and pull their skills and their experiences to better help the sector as they were uniquely placed with lived experience of the African continent. And so that's how SSAP started. And we joined a partnership that um, you may or may not already know, which is Hub Cymru Africa. I think some of you might know of one of our partners already, Fair Trade Wells. We, great. Um, and we are also made up of another two partners, um, this being the Welsh and Africa Health Links Network and the WCIA. Um, and so together, we essentially work to support the sector in various ways, um, to help uh, various organisations with their own development internally, capacity building, funding. Really, we are just there to support any Welsh-based organisations. And so that's a little bit about, um, yeah, where I'm kind of coming from. Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and yeah, I want to, as you already know, talk to you today about global solidarity, language and courage. But firstly, I actually want to start with an anecdote, um, because when I was writing this, I was sitting in my garden. Um, this was probably last week. We've been having amazing weather um, in London, which is where I'm from. And so I was sitting in the garden, it was really sunny, and I was looking at the grass. And I remembered this article that I'd read a couple days before about um, why you shouldn't cut your grass in May, which I found really interesting because I've not heard of this before. Um, so the article was essentially just saying, leave your grass to grow because there's going to be more flowers for pollinators and we know these are our friends. Um, and I remember I was kind of fast forward again back to me in the grass and I'm like, oh no, I forgot to tell my brother, and I'm looking at this really nice cut grass now. Like, Faith, what have you done? Um, my brother, obviously, he's in charge of cutting the grass, and this is something that I love. I prefer to sit on cut grass, if I'm being totally honest. But with the knowledge I had, I actually would have loved to see wild grass growing, and we have loads of dandelions and daisies and random flowers that I don't know the names of. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I'd forgotten to tell my brother this, so he cut the grass. And it actually made me think about global solidarity, because in the same way, we all have our own knowledge, we all have our own expertise that we can share with each other. And through that, we can all have like a much greater impact. So in this particular case, if I had told my brother, not only would we have helped the pollinators, he also would have had a week off. But alas, I did forget. And so that kind of leads me a bit more into global solidarity. But before I get really into it, I want to take us back 
slightly as to how we got here. Um, I'm sure you're probably thinking, I thought this is international development, but now I'm hearing global solidarity. But don't worry, we'll get there. So, oh, I don't know how to use this clicky thing. There we go. So, I want to talk firstly about where it all began. Um, unfortunately, this did start with slavery and colonialism. International development was a project that was rooted in this, as initially many European countries were exploiting other countries. I'm sure you all may already know this. Um, but over time, it actually became a bit more cost effective to what they called constructively exploit um, different countries. And by this, they meant using civilizing projects and development projects in these areas, as this would create a sense of loyalty to the empire. And so they made these racial hierarchies, these gender hierarchies, and instead of referring to people as backward and savage, over time, this actually changed and it became undeveloped or uh, poor. And so the language of development is now changing and we're moving forward in time and the work is changing as well. But some of this rationale isn't actually catching up with the change in the language. And so we're actually reproducing some of these power dynamics that were made in the times of colonialism and slavery. And so um, whilst Europe is going through stages of industrialization, there is active underdevelopment in many countries across the world. And so, um, oh, I'm not gonna lose my place. Um, and so over time, development is going on, but there are these policies that are actively undermining development. There are structural adjustment policies which only took place like in the 80s that actively undermined some of this work that was being done um, to help develop. And so these power structures, again, are continually being upheld. And so the language is only reproducing the same thing even though it has changed. And so with development, again, taking more and more people in, it's becoming a bit more of a diverse sector. People are learning. Conversations around decolonization are happening, but they're not quite mainstream just yet until 2020. And I'm sure most of you may know where I'm going with this. A black man is killed. He is murdered by a police officer in uh, Minneapolis, this man being George Floyd. And this sparks the Black Lives Matter protests, protests all across the world against racial injustice. And in this moment, there is something that is sparked and everyone's having these conversations about racial injustice, about all types of injustice and how we can do better. And the same thing is happening within international development. People are asking questions such as, how did we get here? Why are we doing the work we were doing? What led us here? Who's got the power? And so this kind of takes me to back to SSAP and a project we began during this time called Reframing the Narrative. And so this project was one that was seeking to challenge the organizations in the sector. We were looking to make organizations reflect on their place and so we had a couple of uh, webinars around decolonizing development these looked at the history of development the power structures that existed um, it looked at the images and the language that was used both internally and externally and so we were trying to, again, just get organizations to start thinking about that rationale, thinking about the why. And so we also had an amazing campaign. It was a photography campaign called Back in the Day. As you can see, I've got some pictures here, and these are from the campaign we had. And um, we essentially asked members of the diaspora, what does development look like to you? We wanted to move away from the poverty porn we normally see, the images that are taken often without consent, without respect, without 
regard for how this is impacting perceptions of Africa. We wanted to move away from that and we wanted to showcase images by the people, from the people, images that showcase dignity and respect. And so in this uh, project of reframing the narrative, we weren't just trying to tell other people to do something different. We were trying to do something different as well. And so we also actually had a film festival and this in a similar way to the uh, photography campaign, the film festival was showcasing African filmmakers telling their own stories, telling a wide variety of stories and seeing these different issues from different perspectives. We wanted to showcase this within the sector to make people stop and just think. And so in doing this, some of the questions that are now coming up are, you know, what are decision-making practices like in your organisation? Are these practices equitable? Are your partnerships fair? You know, who do they serve? Is your staff diverse? Are there good levels of inclusion? Where maybe it's a small team and perhaps the team isn't the most diverse team, are you seeking to understand those lived experiences of people? Are you listening to them? And so through reframing the narrative, these questions are now kind of coming up a bit more and a bit more. And so again, in doing this, we were starting to move from just international development, but towards global solidarity. Global solidarity being a partnership. It's saying, I'm standing with you, I'm seeing you and I'm listening to you. And together, we're gonna try and do something that is going to make the world just a little bit better. Not any big ideas, not any I'm gonna save the world, but we're gonna to work together and we're just gonna do something to have a bit of a positive impact. And so we are now moving towards this listening, this uh, starting point of what do you need? How can I help you? This is what SSAP and HCA are trying to do more and trying to inspire others to do. And so um, through Global Solidarity, we are now trying to encourage partnership working, equitable partnership working. And I think especially coming here and seeing all the amazing work that you all do, it's just so, it makes me smile, you know? It, I love it, it makes me so happy because Prior to actually coming to SAP, I worked in a, another diaspora organization which um, focused a lot more on trade and its impact. And seeing the amazing work you guys do to help people, not just in giving aid, but in saying, actually, we can work together and you can do something that's of value and that's gonna help you and I can do something that's of value and that's gonna help me. And together we can have this positive impact. And so being here is just, yeah, it's been really inspiring. I've really loved just seeing what everyone does and the things you all make. It's, it's yeah, it's great. And so essentially, um, seeing this, it's beautiful because it's like, I'm now seeing the level, the, the playing field becoming a bit more level. We're moving away from that, that aid focus, that donation focus. And we are practically standing in global solidarity with people around the world, not just focusing on ourselves as individuals, but saying that this work we do is communal and we want it to be positive for everybody involved. And so global solidarity doesn't actually focus on any single issue. It doesn't pick one. It says they're all interlinked. You know, my work, whilst it might not be the same as your work, there are points that perhaps we can work together on and we can say, okay, I can bring this knowledge that I have, you can bring this knowledge that you have and let's work on something and actually, you know, move, uh, move forward together. And so um, in doing this, I think as well, it's also really important to think sustainably, which love being care, love, I've honestly been speaking so much about cats this center is just ah, oh, speaking to my heart. I really love it. But again, being sustainable in the work you're doing and thinking about that long-term impact, thinking about what would your work look like if 
perhaps you were no longer there? Would it continue? What impacts would it have? What impact do you want to have? It's okay if you just want to have a project that completes something and it focuses on a specific issue, that's fine. But knowing that that's the impact you're having and you want to work in a way that is positive for everybody involved. And so as well, I, I um, think that in this, you and I, everybody here, everybody in our networks is working in global solidarity. And now you're probably thinking, okay, there's a lot about global solidarity. Well, what about language? And I will get to that, don't worry. So, language, I think, is something that is so important, but without a changing of rationale, understanding, Changing language doesn't really mean much. You know, you can start saying something differently, but if you don't understand why you're saying something differently, you're just relabeling the same old thing. You know, I can take a container of sugar and put salt on it. It's still sugar, just there's salt now. And similarly, with language, I think it's really important to first think about the why. I think it's so important to know your why. Why are you using the language you use? Why are you using it over other terminology? Is there better ones or are there ones that you would like to avoid? Think about that why, so that this can actually be reflected in the work you do as well. I think specifically within global solidarity, that is kind of what it is doing. It is moving away from the old rationale, those old colonial legacies and saying, actually, I want to move forward. I want to break away from that. I want to be equal, not just in name, but in the work I do. And so that is actually how our language started to change and move away from international development towards global solidarity. And so um, I think it's really important to ensure that Firstly, you know this, I think there are so many different areas in here, I can't speak specifically to everyone's, but know your why. Know your why when it comes to language. Don't just take anything because it sounds better or because perhaps it should be better, but really interrogate it. Think about where it came from, think about you know, how it got there, you know, what are the roots of that language, that terminology that you use or you don't use. Um, it's really, really important to have that rationale because like I said, that will be reflected. I always think sometimes around gender inclusivity, it's something that on paper is really easy to do. You swap out a few words and that's it, done. But it's all good and well having it on paper. If a group or an organization or a brand isn't gender inclusive in its practice, then why does it bother changing its language? So I, I think it's so, so important that first think about your why when it comes to language. And finally, courage. Courage, my, one of my favorite topics. I think courage and global solidarity go hand in hand. Working in global solidarity is so courageous. It takes courage to do this. It takes courage to speak on an issue that you feel is important. It takes courage to speak up and say, I think this is wrong. It takes courage to say, I think this is right. It takes courage to say, you know what? I haven't been doing something this way, but I think I've got, I can learn from this person. I can learn from that brand. And courage, sometimes it sounds like really big and self-sacrificing, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be courage in the small things too. Courage in the work you do. Courage in taking time to just learn a little bit more. You know, courage in saying that actually, okay, this is my limit. And here you go, I'm gonna pass the baton on to you because I understand that you now have something to add to the work that we are all trying to do together. And so I think it's really important to be courageous. It's really important to support each other. It's really important to speak up, especially in the face of injustice. I think this is something that can sound kind of frightening. Often 
a lot of issues become quite politicized and that makes us recoil. You know, we don't really want to talk about politics, but sometimes we have to have the courage to do this. We have to have the courage to say, actually, this isn't wrong, this isn't right, you know? This is wrong, and especially, especially when you see it and you know that no one else is saying it, have a little bit of courage. Say something, do it, you can do it. I believe in all of you here, you can do it. And I know it does seem daunting, but all of us here, we all have a bit of power. We all have privilege. I know often uh, people think of privilege and they immediately think of white privilege, but we all have a level of privilege. I'm privileged in the fact that I am part of a diaspora community. I went to university. Uh, these things afford various opportunities to me that perhaps if I wasn't a uh, part of these groups, I might not have these opportunities. In the same way, everyone here has their own position positionality. Everyone here has their own privilege. But this means you're actually uniquely placed to speak on different things, you know? You're uniquely placed to use that courage and say, actually, this issue, I think we need to talk about it. We need to work on it. We need to do better. And so courage is something that I think we all need to have a little bit of. And if you don't take anything away from this, if you haven't listened to anything, I know I, I've been talking a lot, but if you take nothing else away, please take this. You'll get it wrong. <laughs> you will get it wrong. I'm so sorry to break it to you. You're gonna stumble, you're gonna make a mistake. It's gonna happen. You're gonna make a mistake and get it wrong. And that's okay. It's okay. I'm hoping that there aren't any androids here because I'm going to say that I'm assuming we're all human. And that's kind of our thing. Humans, we get things wrong. And it's okay to know that, actually, I want to speak on this issue, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to take time to learn and listen, but I believe it's necessary to speak on it. Know that in that moment of fear when you're about to say whatever it is and you think, oh my gosh, what if I get it wrong? Do it anyway. Just do it. You might get it wrong. And someone might say, hey, you got that wrong, actually. And it might be, you know, uncomfortable. It might be really awkward to hear that. But then you use that moment as a learning experience. You grow from it. You remember, okay, I learned this then, and so now I'm gonna do things differently. This person told me, actually, there's a better way of doing something, so that's what I'm gonna do. It's okay to get things wrong. I think sometimes, in being courageous, sometimes we're about to do it, and then we stop. Maybe we saw somebody else, and perhaps on social media, they were called out, and now we're like, oh, I don't know if I wanna speak on this issue anymore. No, just do it. Just do it. Be courageous. Know that I might get it wrong, and that's okay. Because even if you get it wrong, that's a moment of learning. That's an experience that you can then share with someone else, and you can stop them from getting it wrong, and hopefully vice versa. So be courageous, don't be deterred. Don't be afraid to say this is wrong or this is right. Don't be afraid either way. I really do believe in everybody here. Um, and uh, I think that actually, kind of, so getting back to that anecdote that I had at the beginning about the grass, in that moment, I felt really bad, not because I was angry at my brother or anything. I felt bad that I had this knowledge and I didn't share it, and now look what happened. The grass has been cut. The bees aren't gonna have food. What am I gonna do? I was so upset with myself, but it's okay. I got it wrong. I made a mistake, I forgot. I'm gonna remember this because I care about the bees. I'm gonna write it down next time. I'm gonna put a reminder on my phone and I'm gonna say, okay, on tomorrow, I'm gonna tell my brother, don't cut the grass when you're about to cut the grass. I'm gonna share the knowledge I have. I'm gonna share the information I have with him so that he can do better and he can go forward and not cut the grass in his own garden as well. 
And so that, again, kind of goes all the way back to global solidarity. Take that knowledge, take your expertise and share it. Make sure you listen to others, listen to the people with the lived experience, listen to the people that have done the work already. Ask maybe, how can you support, how can you work together? How can you do this fairly, equitably? How can you ensure that whatever you're working on is sustainable, it's not hurting anyone, including the environment? And um, I think if we can all try and just be a bit courageous, if we can all try and say, I don't have the answer to everything and I don't have to, then hopefully, yeah, we can have some positive change in the world. And that's me. I think it's just the switch at the bottom. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, as the last um, scheduled talk of the day, I think we couldn't have ended on a better note. I'm slightly feeling I'm not, I'm not going to have to give my future goals and aims to talk because you've covered quite a lot of it already, <laughs> which is good. We might have more time for tea. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Faith? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Faith. Um, I absolutely loved your presentation. Um, brilliant ideas. And we do need to get the narrative, start a different narrative um, as opposed to what, you know, what has been going on. Um, and it has strong links to colonial past. However, when, I, when you were talking about it, I remembered a campaign, because I'm from India, uh, and a few years ago, the Indian government decided to have this campaign of India shining, which completely ignored 80% of the population which was not shining, not <coughs> reaping the benefits of the uh, things happening in the cities. Um, and the result of that is that we are still seeing masses of poverty, inequity, social injustice, lots of problems. You name it, we have it there. Uh, but it was because of that campaign that these were ignored. So is there a middle path? And so that's one question, and I'll add on to this question. <laughs> um, you also mentioned that you know, donations and, 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 and things are, are not the way, and trade not aid has always been my um, intention uh, for the development of, um, uh, of, of people, communities, and restoring um, some uh, equity in the, in, our, uh, in the wider planet as well. Um, so that combined with the middle path what is your what is your view on that? Gone. Right. So if you if you change the narrative to, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the happy smiling people, you know, there is no poverty. People are great, you know. And I'm just, I'm just thinking about that, that rise, India Shining campaign that happened and which completely ignored the problems that were there, uh, because of which we are still really under all of those problems. Um, but there has to be a balance, hasn't there? Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. I think um, in finding a middle path. I think one of the things that's really important is ensuring that there isn't a single voice. There isn't a single source of information, but we are listening to everyone. Everybody has a voice, and some people are unfortunately silenced. Some people's voices just aren't as loud. And it's making the effort to listen to as many different perspectives and voices 
as possible. And I think in doing that, you kind of create the middle path that I think you're speaking of. Because I, I totally understand being uh, from the diaspora, I'm Nigerian. Much of Nigeria that I know and have seen is probably not the Nigeria a lot of people who aren't Nigerian know. It's really fun if you're young and you wanna just like party. It's a great place to go just to party. But often we hear stats such as, you know, it's, it's got the highest poverty levels, one of the highest poverty levels in the world. But that is actually true as well. And these things do coexist simultaneously and it's ensuring that you aren't just focusing on a single thing, you're not just focusing on a single issue, but you're listening to everyone or as many voices as you can and saying, okay, this exists and that exists and they exist simultaneously, but how can we bring these two groups closer together? How can we ensure that there isn't as much poverty, there isn't any poverty, how can we decrease the social injustice? And how can we also enjoy and party? You know, it's saying that we can do all of those things as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I hope that was a yeah. sufficient answer. Right answer. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I'll come back in. So, so that now someone over there. Yes, I knew it'd be someone over there. <laughs> And I still don't have my phone on me, so I'm not keeping track of my steps. Um, thank you for that talk. That was really, really good. Um, I understand that you prefer trade, i.e. the sending of money and the returning of goods, to charity, i.e. the sending of money with no expectation of return. And... Um, I understand that you also see charity maybe as a bit of an extension of a, of a colonialist thinking. Um, I personally think that, it's really, that charity is really important and that we give without expecting any return and that in particular it's a really strong way to uh, help the poorest who cannot always send something in return. And I think that when we do trade and or when we give people charity, we need to be certain that is, that's a dignified um, exchange and that we take everybody into consideration and, and that we work with humility. But I'd like to know a little bit about, more about your aversion to just giving <laughs> with taking nothing in return. Um, I want to apologize. I don't actually have any aversion to the concepts of just giving. I love it. I love presents. <laughs> I love it. I love the idea of just giving someone something because they need it, because they want it. I unfortunately do think that we don't live in a vacuum where we can just do things that are in and of themselves good. I think that unfortunately those legacies that I spoke of do exist. And so there is a balance that needs to be found. And I do think that charity is important. I think that we need to think both short-term and long-term. And so like you said, those people that are in the poorest communities and perhaps can't do some of the uh, trading that other people have the opportunity to do, in that short term, it is important to just give because everyone deserves a dignified life. And I think it is really, really important and vital, and I do agree with that. But I also think it's important to challenge how they got there, what systems led to um, those conditions to the point that they are living in poverty and starving. I think it's really important to think not just of um, the, if you will, the symptom, but what's the root cause of this? You know, what policies have been in place internationally as well as nationally that have led to some people thriving and some people living um, lavish lives in the same country where other people don't have enough food to eat. I think it's really important to do both. So I think charity is important and trade is important. Advocacy is important. I think you can't just focus on one single thing. Again, almost like in a similar way to 
not listening to a single voice. There isn't a single silver bullet that's going to solve all our issues. We have to do various different things to short-term, medium-term, long-term, solve the root cause and the symptoms and make sure that we are working in collaboration with each other so we know what you know someone else is doing and we can learn from what they're doing as well. Um, and I hope that's okay. Anybody else got any questions? How are we doing on time, Joanna? Seven minutes. Anybody else? No? You answered all the questions. <laughs> um, thank you, Faith, so much. I could I could listen to you all day. You're just your voice and the way that you just present that information, which is actually really quite challenging, difficult stuff in such a gracious and uh, open way and encouraging was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. So before lunch, which is in probably six minutes now, a um, couple of quick announcements. Um, there are still copies of the annual report. Please can someone take them because Julia spent a long time printing them.